Graeme Shane is one of these people that I feel I have known since forever, and that is an illusion. I've only known him since uh, somewhere in the 70s. Uh, he didn't complete his training at the AA for various <coughs> reasons which I don't know anything about until 69, and then he came out and immediately the 70s started showing some kind of effect from this new input. The 70s, it's a very interesting period, psychologically disturbed, brutalism reaching its apogee, system architecture taking off, and yet it's the very period when postmodernism, down underneath in the roots, is beginning to make its funny little caterpillars and come up all different. So the 70s is a key period for you guys to understand. Why did modernism change in the 70s? What happened to modernism in the 70s? I think that one of the things that happened in the 70s was that modern design got bigger and bigger and bigger and came up against some kind of limitation of size. And this is to do with the frontier between individual design on the site, which I call the clash of gestalts. How it looks to you on the drawing board when your site boundaries are nice and firm and what actually happens on the ground in the city. In other words, architecture conceived as a separate thing and when put in position, there's a subtle change that happens to it. And the question of architecture in the city then is for me one of the prime questions about modern design. Where does architecture stop and the city take over? Are cities designed or do they just grow? Are they accident? Are they the, f the result of purely economic forces or some kind of problem of that kind? Of course, Colin Rowe did a first shot at this with Collage City, uh, suggesting that the city could never be a complete whole, but would always have to be a mix-up of different competing ideas, which I think is broadly true. But Graham has gone a step beyond Colin Rowe. He was taught at one time by Colin Rowe, but has gone beyond that now to a more systematic analysis of the way cities grow. And his suggestion is that there is a kind of uh, almost geometrical, almost uh, statistical, almost scientific, almost system type of pattern that takes place which you can find in some kind of way in pretty well all cases of rapid city growth. And he's going to tell us about this. That's why his thing is called fractal city. Fractals, from the Latin word fraction, which is to do with broken bones and uh, parts, into the modern city. So without getting any deeper into it, because I wouldn't be able to go any deeper than that, I would call on Graham to explain everything. Graeme Shane. Uh, oh, th uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, um, Can I just have my lecture back? You, uh, which one is it? No, that was my one. This was mine. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a terrifying moment. <laughs> Um, I, as, as Bob said, I, I did study here. Um, I was a product of the what could be called the end of the high modernism and the archigram years, and uh, and then I, uh, in my thesis, which I actually presented in this room years ago in '69. Uh, and, and actually today, seeing people sitting outside with their portfolios waiting to be reviewed took me right back. Uh, uh, in my thesis, I tried to put Archigram into the city, something they hadn't done. I, I was very much enamored of them, but I thought there was a question. And then as a reaction against all of this uh, work that I, uh, I had uh, on the sort of technological front, I went across to, co to Cornell and studied Colin Rowe looking at uh, urban patterns of London, and I'm going to show you work from my thesis which uh, you'll see these stained yellow slides which are um, fading fast. I mean, I, it's just in time this computer technology is coming, I'm telling you. If you ever work on paper and you print on dye line, watch out. I mean, I don't know whether people still do that, but you know, I put this thesis away for 20 years, I opened it up, and the, you'll see the pictures, they're, re they're yellow. I mean, the lines are just, a, you can just about scan it in. Anyway, so I did work on, on London then, 
And then I went off and had a whole career teaching, as, as Bob's saying, and writing. And then recently, I've been teaching for the last 10 years urban design at, at Columbia, and, and as I've been doing that, I've been slowly coming around to seeing that the work that I did years and years and years ago had another kind of relevance now that we have uh, paperless studios and um, soft image and all sorts of programs that you can, that things that you imagined in and as a student as you were working with your yellow trace through all these layers, you can now animate and uh, bring to uh, a whole nother level of, of understanding because you can actually have set up uh, patterns of motion uh, through repetition and uh, change over time. And so things that like Cedric Price and people that taught me in my youth used to talk about have all of a sudden come in, uh, this is all from the AA of course, uh, have, has all sort of sudden sort of fallen into a whole new pattern for me. And um, I'm very excited about that. Now at the same time, being a, um, I can't pretend to be a scientist and to be a great math mathematician. And uh, p fractals to me are something very serious in terms of, uh, they have to do with our ability to recognize pattern, and uh, which is a psychological thing that I think is actually built into the human brain, this pattern making tendency. And this pattern has to do with repetition, it's just once won't do, and then yet there's variation. So there's one whole part of this that has to do with pattern and variation. And then the other part of this in the fractal city part has to, and this is very important, that there are very few simple rules, maybe five, maybe seven. And that these rules code the pattern, and the pattern has some kind of perimeter or boundary to it, which is very important in terms of how I analyze London. When I worked here before in London, I was uh, absolutely obsessed with property ownership. Now, and the way in which, like, we're sitting in the Bedford estate, it belonged to the Duke of Bedford, how much land he had. And this was a product of uh, the whole 60s anti-development fever that possessed uh, all the students. We were quite radical in those days. And the idea of working for Richard Seifert, for instance, was beyond the pale. Now, we're, hu we're much more humble. And we recognize reality and, you know, work for Richard Seifert, I guess, if we get the chance. But I don't know. <laughs> but anyway property and the, this was a sort of the idea that there was a perimeter that the land could be seen who owned it and then that, that there was a somehow in, within the city there was this communal memory that of this that held these patterns that would repeat in and be imprinted onto the land as a, a in a very strange kind of way and continue over 250 years against all odds railways crashing in docks crashing in a uh, whole telegraph, telephone, everything, even electricity was banned from some of these uh, little fractal pieces. So the, I, I uh, in, and in when I started to look at the way in which these codes ruled these pieces, I started to go back to something which was very, very important to me when I was younger, which was um, uh, Sir John Summerson, who used to teach here in the history uh, before Charlie and everything. Uh, um, sorry, there's the history. I feel very historic in this place. Uh, he wrote a book called Georgian London, which I was absolutely shocked to find is out of print. And he laid out how the great landowners of London laid out London to the West. And so my work drew on that. And that was before the London Survey had developed. There's a big GLC thing, book called the London Survey, which is like you know 27 volumes. Uh, and that lays out all the rules and codes and who lived where and so on and so forth for all these pieces of London that I'm going to show you. So, okay, I had this idea, okay, uh, there's patterns, there's a kind of communal memory. Each of these places uh, that were made within each fragment of property ownership became like little mini towns. And they had a life within them that changed over time. And for instance, that uh, Covent Garden was once a very classy place to live. Then uh, slowly, as new estates developed further out, it went more and more downhill. Uh, bath houses moved in, theatres moved in, prostitutes moved in, became the red light theatre district. 
Then the market moved in and it became an industrial area. Then it was about to be demolished when I was a student here. And then all of a sudden, boom, you know, it's back again as a, a great tourist mecca. So these places have these lives over time that are really fascinating. And um, one, of, I start, one of the things that fractal, the way of, of looking at through the city through the sort of fractal glasses gave me was a way of, uh, in fractals, I'll show you this, some of the slides, there, there is this whole preoccupation with phase changes, that things can begin as one thing, get transformed slowly into something else, and then the code can completely flip and they become something even different again. So change and uh, especially gradual change or sudden change can be engineered uh, or seen to be uh, tracked through um, the phase change mechanism of, of fractals. And this was um, something very, very exciting to me because in my research on London, like the great estates ran out and then they suddenly they got to sort of Paddington and boom, they suddenly became villas. And, and the same if you go north and the same if you go south, the streets stop and they become villas. And it has to do with topography, has to do with railways, it has to do with lots of things. But it also was a phase change that people no longer wanted to live on a street. They wanted an individual place. There was a whole uh, kind of m c cultural paradigm shift, if you like, that took place. And so I was really um, very excited about the potential to tie uh, the fractal pattern making uh, the way in which the scale of the fractal got larger and larger and larger until it collapsed, and then a new model emerged. Uh, I was very, very excited about that aspect of, of fractals. And then the other part that was really fascinating is this scale change. The whole idea of scaling, that a self-organizing unit, like a, which is a fractal, like a, one of these London estates, they get repeated and repeated and larger and larger and larger, and then eventually they collapse. The organization isn't there to support them. The formal organization collapses. The social organization breaks down. The management of the thing breaks down. And uh, then they shift to a more manageable system at a smaller scale. And then they grow that one, and then that one collapses. And I started looking at the history of the city through that kind of lens. And... Um, that, that produced another whole sort of set of readings in terms of scaling because, for instance, the London docks start off real small and then they get, you know, to be two miles long going east or even longer. And so there's a whole amazing pattern that you can see going to the east. The, the scale of Covent Garden compared to the Grosvenor Estates in Pimlico, Belgravia, or um, around Grosvenor Square is enormous. You could fit, you know, several small towns into those, that uh, acreage. And, you know, th th but it's at its limit when it's working at that scale and then the collapse follows very shortly afterwards. So I'm sorry for, I'm trying to give you an outline and I haven't been doing many slides and that's always a bad thing with, a vi you know, architects, we're visual people. So um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to I've given you the, my main argument. So I'm looking at London as a fractal city, and uh, I want to just go through these little notes. Uh, Osimo, where is he? My, I have my friend working the mouse. Uh, let's, can we do the diagram movie? <coughs> and we're going to try and do this ballet with uh, these little machines here. Okay, so this is... Um, I've, uh, one of the th I came at this initially from a layered approach to the city. Uh, where you could uh, layer information, but also layer the, si the city vertically in terms of its section. Uh, this is something, I mean, if you know, if you know um, Alvin's old Chicago lecture was about layers or Rem's work or Bernard's work or anyone's work from the AA in the, uh, where's Bob, 70s? It was all about layers <coughs> all right, and systems. So this is, take, I, this is where I came from. Okay, next one. And then I moved into this whole idea of the patterns of growth, that the city is a field, and it has poles, that are, which are strange attractors. And the, the, like, for instance, in 
The, the, the Sir John Summerson traditional uh, analysis of the city is that the east was the smelly side and the industrial side, the west was the uh, fine residential side, and of course the prevailing wind is from the southwest, so the smells would go off. It's an ecological argument, right? And uh, then the city, if you think of this as the Roman city of London, uh, and then the western growth where we're sitting in Bedford Square, the east end and the industrial growth out to the east, of course, you can do it north-south as well. Then um, I started uh, looking, okay, here's the old center. Uh, there's a new attractor. The new growth is the edge of the city. This is where it's the cleanest air, the freshest uh, land, and the newest development, which is always attractive. People even now are still moving out on the edge of London, miles and miles out. And, of course, this can work for both the smelly and the and the sweet, if you like, the sweet and the sour. Uh, you can set up these poles in many different ways. But these are attractors. This, it says negative. Uh, it's just a relative term. This, for industry, this was the best place to be. The land was cheap. Uh, the land to this side was more expensive. It was better drained uh, and better for residential development. And then, so you have the two attractors, the strange attractors on the either side of the city. Powering the growth, of course, this is along the Thames the linear uh, element that joins the, uh, all parts of the city. If you get to go and see Shakespeare in Love, enjoy the boat scenes. People travel up and down the Thames uh, to get from one part of the city to the other. The edge of the city was to the water. It was a fabulous, fabulous city. Uh, and then there's a two different morphologies start to develop uh, on either side of the city. We're sitting in Bedford Square. Uh, maybe this is Gower Street, if you flipped it. Uh, but the idea is that there's a void at the center. Uh, the space is made by the buildings around it. And in figure ground terms, uh, um, I call this uh, type A morphology. This is coming out of my Cornell training. But uh, the idea is that the space is valued at the center uh, as a, a visual um, uh, positive. Okay, sorry. And then the type B morphology, you might... Uh, uh, this in Cornell terms is called an object building, object fixation. They don't like it. But this is like a huge supermarket with the highway access, one of REM's generic boxes. Or it could be a warehouse with a railway access. It's something, uh, it's a very different setup than the street based system that's a type A morphology. Type B morphology has to do with high speed communication. And then an interior world within this box or, or the object. So you have, uh, two, and in, in the docklands, you get a very different uh, set of morphologies developed, industrial morphologies developed, that are very different than the residential morphologies in the West. So the city starts to polarize out, not only in terms of function and uses, and, li and life world of the docks with the workers, and the uh, spending of the fruits of the empire in the East, uh, but also the building morphologies uh, turn into very different systems. Okay, next. And then the pattern of the city. Once you have, you've accepted this kind of fractal idea of the, the two poles and the space between as an energized field, an event field, whatever you want to call it, how do you organize that space? You can organize it in a linear system. This is the oldest system in the world, the armature, uh, which is, a, you know, the ancient Romans had armatures they worked in about 600-foot increments. Uh, they were uh, the, the main street of their camp. Uh, the medieval cities had armatures also worked in 600-foot incre increments. So do shopping malls. The main stores will be on either end of this. And then you, these things have a kind of mnemonic quality that you can remember stuff along the length of it. And then you need a break. Uh, and then you do another bit. And it's, so this is a, a kind of... A, a fractal pattern that was repeated through time, an incredible uh, uh, number of places I've found it. And then at a city scale, uh, this thing of the central and then the edge can produce either ring systems, uh, radial systems, or in London's case, ring radials, which is a very common uh, sort of pattern. And it's also a very common fractal pattern. So this, uh, we're in sort of very easy territory here dealing with a transformation from uh, fractal patterning at a, at a certain uh, geometric scale into the city. And of course, this is my diagram of 
Ebenezer Howard's city, in which he, I, haven't, uh, I have a slide later on that'll show you this, in which each mini city, new town, in beyond the green belt, each new town was a replica of what was in here, so it repeated at a small scale, which is a classic fractal. So th this is a, a, with a scaling change from the center to the edge. And the idea was that these would grow and this would decay. And the, the, the edge would slowly replace the uh, evil, crowded, super dense um, street-based city with the garden city, which would be uh, pure, kind of green, uh, ventilated, and a uh, new town. It would be a, a, a town, but in the country. Uh, a hybrid with the, two, the three magnets and so on. Okay, so this is a fractal very easy entry into starting to look at London in terms of fractals. We have actually got new towns, and I'll look at the way they're made too in a minute. Okay, awesome. And uh, then um, the fractal city produces these um, enclaves, these, these like this could be Bedford Square or the Bedford Estate, or it could be a mega shopping mall, or it could be um, an airport. And they plug into these infrastructures and this is, was Kevin Lynch's city machine diagram. And it also is a fractal si system with these pieces separated out. And then it has a kind of extended armature system that is the infrastructure that ties it all together. And he, of course, he did his diagrams in the 80s, just before he died, uh, the machine city diagrams. Uh, but I've added into that the satellite communications, the electronic world that ties all this stuff together and changes it fundamentally. Uh, and I want, you know, the whole idea of the communal memory telling you how to make the uh, city squares and the city streets or the 600-foot uh, module or any of this stuff gets changed once you introduce media, mass communications, images. The image of the city can be in any of these pieces. It doesn't have to be in the center anymore. And so you end up with like Joel Garreau's Edge City model here, uh, where, which I've modified to, um, I'm sorry, this thing... I have to try and hold myself, not be nervous, point it firmly, get it steady. Uh, but it exaggerates every movement. And, you know, I did have a scotch, so what can I say? <laughs> uh, what's happening here? <laughs> but what's happening here is this is a modified version of Ebenezer Howard. And I think this is more like the way London is turning out. And also American cities, and um, I would say Bangkok or... All sorts of ci or most cities that are developing in the postmodern era are starting to develop these strips around the highway so that you get an edge city that is uh, made of these uh, um, Kevin Lynch's machine city pieces around a highway which goes about 20 minutes. This is all based on uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. The American Defense Department, they saw what happened after the war, they saw what the bomb did, and they built the Eisenhower highways all five miles out because the bombs of that period would wipe out the central city. And, this, so they, and then they got federal finance to build the malls. You got five years tax abatement, all this stuff. Uh, also to build, then they used the uh, federal money to give cheap loans to the returning uh, soldiers. So that they would, and then, surprise, surprise, they built 600-foot-long cul-de-sacs in Levittown uh, which to build the, their mass-produced houses all out around this strip, around the central city. And the Venturis would talk about the roads, the strips that went out to the edge. Those were the old strips. The new strips are a completely different uh, system. They're much more fragmented into these enclaves connected by electronic media and armature, the sort of highway armature. And then at the nodes where these highways intersect, you get these, these regional malls developing, and they have 600 foot you know, between the twin poles. And this is a perfect little fractal setup, which is repeated you know, in America. Oh, it's almost 60% of all retail transactions uh, oh, take place inside these, these spaces between, in, in between these two poles. And that's billions of dollars. And now, OK, the net may change it, but when you actually get on the net, you, they the, the model for which they use to navigate uh, these shopping places is either a grid or a linear device very like this. So it's, a, you know, there's cyber malls now. Okay, next. 
And this is just looking at the sort of setup of the mall. Uh, you could do this with the um, Covent Garden estate, and I will show you slides that this comes from looking at Covent Garden. But you have basically um, uh, a high-speed ar communication system armature. You have a gate access, which can be a sign system or a controlled gate. These are very, very important. And then you have in, in the, uh, you have the perimeter of control, which is the real estate boundaries, which are very, very important. They need 60 acres for a shopping mall. They're the same all over America. They're probably the same here and in all over Europe. They, 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 do, they need half a million people within 20 minutes driving time to do a regional mall. And then they need two big department stores and a 600 foot long stretch in between. Uh, of course, this is all, it all changes, it's all very complicated, but this is what's called a dumbbell mall, a basic, it's the basic one. Of course, you can add on another one or turn one at right angles and make uh, enormously complex versions of this. Uh, and then you have at the center a very, very important piece. The armature is set up as an image space between these two poles. It can be themed, and then that's projected out into the media and that's, this image space is what distinguishes it in terms of type A, type B, type C. There's different categories of malls that are aimed at different uh, economic sectors inside the uh, postmodern city. So this fragment or fractal is talking to its surroundings through its electronic linkage. Okay, next one. And this is just that space, the way it can be set up with the valley section. There are all these different ways of managing that space. It's a kind of pictorial space, uh, a scenographic space, and it's what the image element uh, that floats out in cyberspace, in the publicity, in the newspapers, and actually people like it. I mean, old people go jogging there, teens hang out there. This is the new Main Street, and it's a legal problem, whether it's a public or a private space, because it's internal, it's enclosed, and it's private, but it uh, for, you know, legally it's a very complicated thing whether you can do picketing there, for instance. But this is just saying, okay, this is a suburban typical setup. If you're in America and in your New York, like I am, they're still building uh, a Battery Park City. It has a huge uh, regional mall at its center with office towers attached. Uh, it has a park down the edge. And then it has a 600-foot main street on the north enclave, 1,200-foot main uh, Main Street on the south with a break at Rector Place. So this mauling technology idea, has, they, they've brought it into the city because they can market this as a piece of urban fabric, even though it's separate than downtown, the traditional downtown, and it's completely different than Upper West Side or the traditional city. It has the imagery of the street inside its own kind of interior uh, setup. Okay, next. Uh, and this is uh, the way that what they did is they took the coding of the New York City street walls and so on and, and projected it into the Battery Park City. And then um, Duane and Platter Zeidberg took the Battery Park City system of these armatures with their scenographic surroundings and put it down in Seaside. You know, they all face out to the sea and then there's a sort of public space with the three main streets coming in. And it, they, what they did was really amazing because they uh, set up not only the plan, the section, and then a perspective that controlled the codes. If you look in Seaside's codes, each one of these is set to a different economic bracket. And it's, again, the marketing idea that dominates. But they're marketing the image of the city. This was uh, two hours from the nearest airport, please. It's a long way. Right, okay. I wouldn't call that a city if you're two hours from the airport, I'm sorry. <laughs> Next, please. Oh, and this is just looking at the patterns in the vertical. I, I, so I, I was doing plan up to now, but it, it's amazing if you start looking at Team 10 and all the Beaux Arts, they all wanted to make the city with the deep level travel, deep down, local travel in the, just under the grade surface, tracks and tra trucks and tra streetcars at grade, uh, pedestrians ideally raised up, and then offices and then residential. This is like whether you're a modernist or a Beaux-Arts, uh, if you start looking at uh, Smithson's sections or you look in um, Corbett's sections for 
he's a Beaux-Arts architect in New 1927 plan in New York. It's the same. And uh, it's really quite interesting. This is a mall section. The early malls always put the trucks underneath. They didn't want to, they wanted to have sm this window, s s they had parking on the either side and they wanted to have windows on the outside and they put the trucks and a service zone underneath in section. And they often put offices uh, up on top. Never housing. Okay. Next, please. I think I'm finished. Yeah? Okay. Um, so, okay, I've talked to you about fractals. I, um, uh, no, Antwerp. Right. We're going to just, before I do the slides, I actually have to watch the time. Uh, I want to just show you, this was something I prepared for a class that I was doing in Colombia. And if it's running nicely, it's just a very quick look at what you can do with, this is Antwerp, over through the ages. Um, just let it run for a minute without commentary. Okay. Um, so it, um, the, what I was looking at here was uh, how cities... Uh, do you want to run it again? It's nice when it runs fast. This is running slow, but it's okay. Oh, no, not backwards, but just run it through again. What, here it's a ring radial city. The original city is like in here. And then there's a second city that comes around the docks and the, the port here. This is, this, and they were Bruges and um, Amsterdam's great rivals. Okay, uh, okay, and then they fortify themselves because there's perpetual war in the lowlands, right next. Uh, fortify themselves more. But they're developing a whole new dock system up here. And Napoleon builds this dock. Uh, he's going to invade England from here. And uh, actually I was in hi high school with the, admiral, the, son of, the grandson of the admiral who sat out there waiting for them to come out, and they never came out. So uh, his, his grandfather never got famous. It was sad. <laughs> Spent the whole war there. Uh, <laughs> anyway, sorry. Uh, the walls come down, the, uh, and then following uh, the sort of Paris, not really Parisian, but Viennese model, they build a ring road. This is the old armature. There's originally a little canal here. It comes back to the cathedral, the main street. And then it gets extended out to the gate back here. And then, uh, okay, the port's up here. The wall comes down in the uh, 1840s. Okay, then the trains arrive. The docks get expanded enormously. Uh, okay, and then this, once the trains arrive, this is the, the roads in. You can see people gr growing out along the roads in. And then there's a new set of defenses, which includes the train. Now, the train was always in two minds whether to go to the docks or to the center of the city. And the armature gets extended here. All the department stores are all along this street. And there's this wonderful triangular park, which is one of a memory trace of one of the old fortification pieces repeating. But here what you're looking at is that this city grows all the time for defensive reasons in rings and radials. In London, uh, you don't, after a certain period, you just don't have that concern and it grows in a different way. Okay, here they they have a defensive ring where you're not allowed to build, but there are suburbs developing on the outside within walking distance. Uh, what's happening? It's going to be over here. Okay, this is Corb scheme. To d um, actually, Corb scheme, Corb did a scheme for the city extension across the way. Berlaga did one too. And Corb picked up this armature from the cathedral coming through and, and extended it right across. And it's actually, there's a trace of that in this street. But there's a tunnel here. Uh, they took out one of the docks and put in a tunnel. And so this became the way through. Uh, but, uh, but they're still building Corb's scheme for here was an amazing series of um, long slab blocks doing zigzagging through the landscape. So it was a completely different building typology. It was a modernist building typology as opposed to what they actually built. Okay, next one. We, I think we finished. Oh, and then the highway comes where the uh, um, wall used to be. 
very, very common. This is the great connection to, uh, to Brussels. And then uh, here, this is a Toyo Ito project for a new uh, suburban kind of edge city situation at the a new tunnel entrance under the river. But what I was interested in was the way in which this city always grew as a, a kind of a ring radial system and the way in which this armature got extended out and out and out. It's an amazing thing. Thousands, millions of people would come through here on the train and then walk down here and then they got on the ships, uh, the white uh, star line and would go to America. This was the great, one of the great ports along with Bremen. Mi you know, on the other end they end up in, in Ellis Island in New York. And so this was like a, a, an enormous place of pilgrimage for people leaving Europe. And it's one of the main uh, ways of escape. And so, uh, but the pattern just kept repeating, even, uh, uh, even when the, you know, the, f the defenses never ever worked. And uh, it, uh, it somehow was inbuilt into the mayor's office that it would always somehow be a ring radial system, even though uh, the defenses were useless against the Germans in four, five, I don't know how many wars. The only time they worked was against the Spaniards when they flooded the whole of this surrounding land and uh, drowned the Spanish army, essentially. Okay, so this, this was just a little exercise to show uh, maybe how I could apply this to London. So now I need the slides. Awesome. I, someone else has to help switch us to slides. Can you, is it, who's going to, right, sorry. Can you turn the projectors on, or do I have to? Oh, I have to do that. Okay. Phew. Uh, I, Charlie Jenks was here, and he uh, showed me, oh, this Fractal City book. And this is from the Fractal City book, <laughs> which uh, is from the 80s, which, but it's really from the 60s and the 70s, which uh, Bob was talking about. And uh, this is a system, in a way, it's a systems approach uh, it's something that Christopher Alexander started talking about and then uh, retreated from. And uh, uh, it's a one, if you don't know Fractal Cities, the book, uh, I always say it's by Batty Langley, but I know it isn't. But, uh, and I'm not going to be able to remember exactly who did it now. But this is one of their wonderful, there's a whole, it's a very interesting book. This is a, 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 sim a city simulation where they do a ring city, they do a radial city, and then they start to introduce perturbations into the th system that fragment it. And then mixing different, each of the colors is a different use. Now they're not talking about growth controlled to the east or the west or anything like that. There's no, it's just done on a random basis. But it's still separating out, if you like, to there's more blue over here and there's more pink over here maybe. Or, you know, there's, there's this kind of separation between the two sides of the city. It's quite interesting. And this is um, the classic fractal uh, diagram uh, in which a small pattern repeats over, which has very, it has only four rules and repeats over and over and over and over again. And uh, it can form whole coastlines, whole, you know, it's, it's the Mandelbrot pattern. It's one of the very, very famous uh, geometric patterns that you can generate using very, very simple rules. And this, to me, this was very, very interesting, but the geometry is wrong for what I need. Okay, next, please. Oh, no, I do it. Sorry. This is terrible. This and this is just looking at the, you know, simple rules, uh, setting up uh, how these things unfold in space. And then looking at whether it's symmetrical, uh, bilateral symmetry, four around uh, cross axes, uh, whether it has some control system about uh, at... When it, when it divides, whether it divides on a 30, 60, whatever degree angle. So you can set these things self-replicating and they unfold and unfold and unfold and unfold. And if you've ever looked at the, uh, an edge of a city, uh, it, when it's going out a valley, they very often have this kind of pattern. Or, and if also if you've ever looked at um, some very old cities, Sumerian cities or something like that, they have patterns like this. So this is not unusual. And I don't know whether you remember Christopher Alexander in the 60s, he wrote The City is Not a Tree, very famous article. Here's the tree structure that he's talking about, 
uh, where you have a hierarchy, but only one, e it, everything goes to one entrance. And this is very, very important. Uh, Albert Pope wrote a great book a couple of years ago called Ladders, which he, and he calls this a ladder. It's the same basic idea that, and this is very important, this isn't an open-ended grid. There's a, this is, uh, uh, there's a main road, if you like, that comes along here. Then you go into a gateway, then you come off that and into the tree, uh, unfolding ever smaller down the, scaling down the fractal. If you, if you enlarge one of these pieces, it would be another, the same pattern. But uh, the mall, you can analyze the mall to be like this, because you, you come off the highway, you come in, you go into the mall, and then you go into the store, and it's a, this kind of recurrent uh, closure around you. And the same with uh, Covent Garden. You can analyze it in terms of its top uh, topology, in terms of how you move through it in space, uh, in the same kind of fractal system. Okay, to myself next, please. And uh, these things can work in quite complicated ways. Uh, if you want to suddenly invert the code, uh, suddenly you've got, you know, figure grounds kind of things starting to happen. And then this is a very important diagram for me. How do you, if you go through a phase change, how do you get from A to B? And you remember I'm talking about streets to mall. Well, you have a system that's maybe all streets and you have a system that's all malls at one end. And there's uh, always these transition areas, the gray areas in between, the field between the twin poles. And th these things work uh, statistically by uh, proportional systems, how much, like there's a certain point, around 50%, when the phase change will take place and people will begin to recognize the trend is going this way towards the mall or it's going towards the, the old street system. And then they'll shift uh, the pattern will change I within the culture. And uh, this is just showing how, uh, you know, this tree structure works, how the iteration and repetition that's working here is always the same. In a real fractal system, this would, each time it reiterates, it'll be different, minor var variations. And through these differences, new variants will be developed. It's like a kind of virus. And this is what you can do, like, you know, if you go, now here, this is really a beautiful one. Is this a block with an empty garden in the middle? Or is this a mall with an empty car park around it? You tell me. Okay. Here the mall is in the center and it has uh, McDonald's, the fish fry, all the banks in the car parks and, the, you know, the other things around it. Or is it the gardens have small courtyards on, with staircases inside the block and so on. So you can read this either way. Uh, sort of working the pattern as a figure ground. I'm, I'm totally opposed to figure ground. You can ask anyone. I was brought up with it. Uh, it's one dimensional. It only works in plan. Of course, you can project them in section. And it's bla just black and white. What I'm interested in is the gray in between. But I use this as a diagram to sort of set the question of how the pattern changes, uh, which is very, very important for the phase change. And that leads you into the, you know, the whole thing about thermodynamics, how things get from hot to cold. And then the very, very famous Lorentz water wheel, uh, in which the water comes into the bucket. The bucket you know, slowly goes round. The weight drives it round to the bottom. The bucket tips out. And then uh, you know, it comes back up and gets filled. Now, if you take this as a system, an urban system, uh, you could say you know, the malls are at one end let's say, and the uh, streets are at the other, there's a whole set of transitions through that sequence if you see it as a whole system. And that's the kind of one of the big things about the fractal system that helped me to see that these polarized opposites uh, can have relations with each other that are quite complex and uh, mutations within each other. And the other thing about fractals is that the memory trace of the opposite element is always present in, the, in its opposite. So, for instance, in the, in the shopping mall, there's the memory trace of the street. And in the street system, you might have a church, which is an object building, which is like a memory trace of what the shopping mall as an object might be. So there's this flip-flop. Both sides, it's like a yin-yang. There's always the trace uh, that keeps the continuity in a certain kind of way. Uh, um, moving through the system. 
And this is um, just, uh, these, were, these were like very, very important diagrams for me. I'm not sure that I can, I can have a little of my scotch, see if I can get my wobble back. Uh, very watery scotch, but this was a very, this uh, was, a, this was a very, very important diagram for me. That a thing can be in a steady state, growing and growing and growing. Uh, if you think of the great estates of London. So it's kind of, it, it, it finds its pattern and then it stays on the pattern. But then at a certain point, uh, the pattern becomes unstable. And, there's, and the polarization that is implicit in the steady state, the balance, the two pieces start to separate out. One towards uh, one pole, another towards the other pole. Let's say it's towards the supermarket, object buildings, towards the street. And then you enter into what they call the chaotic region, I like that, uh, in which you're in that sort of uh, Lorentzian water wheel space in which uh, you have to find the patterns and look for the, the, the shifting balance between the two forces that are uh, sort of driving the city. And uh, what uh, it was amazing about this diagram was uh, that, with it, that they could make equations that could find these balances. F we're finding, you know, uh, with through uh, probability theory, uh, to balance the the prob you know the likelihood of one thing being dominant or another thing being dominant, and in fact that there were patterns uh, through the phase changes, and that was something that I found um, very very important. And these patterns, of course, had to do with fractals, and so on and so forth. So the story starts coming around again. This is uh, that diagram with the Lorentzian um, diagram of the phase change also works into, like if this is one pole and then over time it loops and loops and loops and then the, th the system will focus on around one thing and then switch to the other then switch back so that if this is working around one pole at a certain point the system breaks down goes across to the other pole circles the other pole break down comes back and this is, these were just wonderful diagrams and so you get this sort of bipolar situation which, you know, you can obviously apply to cities. Well, to me, you can obviously apply to cities because, you know, East End, West End, whatever you like. Uh, and then this was another interesting diagram because of, uh, I showed you the diagram of um, Ebenezer Howard with a fractal repeating around the edge. And this is uh, um, the Koch curve which is generated with just five rules making this sort of edge situation that's always, these are always repeating, you know, the pattern that's in the larger setup. Uh, I'm not pushing geometry as the solution to the city. You have to know that. So, uh, at this, uh, so you know, but here you have this, this idea of these fractals. The city is the ring radial system, like Antwerp, repeating itself out, uh, and obviously you could do it again forever around the city. The, now, um, when I was talking to you about ladders and uh, Albert Pope's book, Albert Pope talks about the grid as one system which is an open matrix and the ladder as another system which is the enclave and armature system, uh, which has these sort of uh, gateway situations. And this is, uh, these are the two diagrams. So this grid can decompose into a ladder system or stay in a kind of open matrix. This is his basic argument. This is just looking at the, how old this fractal system, uh, you know, if you go back into Renaissance ideal cities and the geometry, their inter Barbaro's interpretation of Vitruvius, uh, you know, these, these patterns, uh, this is from Fractal Cities, the book that Charlie showed me, uh, uh, you know, the, the Koch Islands and so on are very, very present. Uh, but in, in fact, this is a folding system too. Around the different axes, you can see this, you know, that it's actually a folding system around a central point. Very, very simple rules generate this thing. I'm interested in much more complicated systems. So this was useful to me, but it wasn't uh, perfectly useful. And I had done a lot of research about London uh, that, um, uh, I wanted to feed into this. Now one of the famous drawings of London is in Abercrombie's plan of 1945. It was done by Arthur Ling, who was a planner who taught here. And this is all the neighborhoods of London. 
And you can see it's, obviously, if you've been looking at fractals long enough, you get very excited when you see this kind of thing. And this is, again, from Fractal Cities. And his analysis of Ling's... Uh, Ling... Uh, they, there was a hierarchy between all of these neighborhoods, which went to neighborhood centers, which then went to larger centers, which then came to the central business district. And so this is a kind of tree structure. And it has, you know, mathematical repercussions. But then what they did was that they also said, uh, as Chris, following Christopher Alexander, they attacked the British new towns, which were the new towns being built around the outside of the city, uh, following the, our fractal model. Because inside the, the new towns, the same hierarchy that's repeating in this analysis of the old city <laughs> is being re rebuilt on new territory on the edge city, with the, this, uh, uh, the same thing of these gates and the hierarchies, and you, know, you can see it here with the cul-de-sac system. Now in America, there was a, um, they were doing the same thing, and the law was that the cul-de-sac had to be 600 feet. So, you know, the, uh, it's really quite interesting. Um, you know, the if you wanted a federal loan for housing, then this main axis would si be 600 feet. I can't remember why they said you had to do it 600 feet, but, you know, it's interesting that they decided that. And, okay, so I'm trying to bring this fractal stuff around to London. Here's the famous Abercrombie plan uh, sequence of London growth. Uh, it obviously goes out. Remember I was showing you the uh, linear growth out along the uh, avenues of accelerated transport ex ex uh, uh, railways or roads. They, it, the thing grew out these fingers, which are exactly fractal uh, patterns. Then if you went inside this thing, you, you could probably find fractal patterns too. Then uh, this is from the GLC plan in the 70s, where they were looking at where the central business district was, with the main node in the Roman London, uh, then another one around um, Aldwych, Kingsway, and uh, Fleet Street, and then the, we the West End coming out to Hyde Park, Mayfair, and so on. So there's a, there's a growth, what had been residential growth is now turned into a business center. And then there's the industrial center, which isn't even on this map. So that the orientation of positive growth is out here. The, the map in, that, in those days, the docks were reduced down to, I think, 3,000 people working in them. There's been this huge collapse after the Blitz. So the east end of London isn't even shown. The whole orientation when I was growing up was to the west. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep talking to myself. <laughs> now, here, this is the warning I gave you. This is my thesis. Look at the yellow. <laughs> 25 years later. There's my thumb. <laughs> uh, um, and um, I, I'm, this is interesting. Uh, I mean, you all know we're in Bedford Square. Where are we? Down here. No, here. And when people think about London, they always think it's a mess. But in fact, it's got a, if you start to count the squares, um, there's something like, I mean, there's 72 major estates. And they set up, and they controlled the growth for 250 years, and they did it with squares. And they did it over a topography that had several obstacles. There's, first of all, there's the Fleet River. Uh, there's various sort of unnamed rivers that go through Covent Garden. I'm sorry this, this is weak but you can see them pulling back the contour. Uh, then there's the Tyburn that goes through, and uh, there's the Westbourne, and then there's, um, I can't remember what this one's down in Chelsea, and then there's the Brent that goes up to Brent Cross. And so, you know, the, the topography is very important. These were, down here on the, this area here is the gravel terrace where we are. So it's very well drained. And the, but the city was original, the original Roman city was at the crossing point. Then uh, there was a sort of Venetian city that, and why, uh, Westminster's here. There was a whole water-based water development along here. And then when it came time to, for the city to grow westwards, this whole expanse was freely available without any, unlike Antwerp with that ring wall that was always dominating the pattern, they could fly. And what they flew was this a uh, piecemeal system of, of fragments uh, that I, this is from 1971 I did these drawings. So, you know, they're 25 years old. It doesn't mean they're bad, I hope. Uh, but uh, 
this figure ground, you can see the pattern of the grid. So what I was interested in, okay, Summerson's joined in London to the rescue. Uh, here's the land ownership. This was uh, based on Summerson and uh, other material. It was I, when I spent the summer at LSE. And then mapping the land ownership against the patterns. Uh, uh, this is getting in a little closer. Uh, these are all out of my... And then, okay... This is Covent Garden. Originally, Bedford House was down here on the Strand. Uh, when they came, they developed all around the edge of the property, uh, Long Acre, um, Drury Lane, St. Martin's Lane. And uh, when they came to develop it, the king said to them, this is Charles I, he was in his autocratic phase, I'll tell you how to do it and you'll employ Inigo Jones. And what they set up was a uh, the noblest barn in Christendom, the church on the axis, cross axis. So it's a very simple rule. You enter here and the church is on the cross axis. Never mind the door is by the altar and therefore you actually can't get in there. You have to have, by scenographic rules, the uh, terminus to the axis. And then you have a pi what they call the piazza, the arcaded space around it. The two side streets, the two main streets, these actually paid for the development. And then to get into the church, you have the little side cuts and the actual entrance from this side. So if you get married here, you have to walk out to here to get the car. Now, the thing is, and then this space in here is public space, but it's also inside the block. They never did this again. So this was a disaster right from the start. Uh, the Duke of Bedford, or is the Earl of Bedford then, he didn't, uh, what happened was they developed a market in here very quickly. He didn't like that, so he blew out up to Bloomsbury Square and they developed a street cut in here. Th and then very early on, they had the mews, the service mews, around the back. So you're getting a hierarchy, a main axis, dominant <coughs> axis, a cross axis, uh, a public uh, set up around a square. The square is placed in the center of the property. Uh, this is the most valuable houses on the square. The, the, the main development being paid for by these other houses and then the service areas hidden in the back. So you have a center and a descending order hierarchy out towards the edge. The worst stables and everything else is out in the back on the edge. So, you, so there's a set of rules about center and edge, uh, axis, cross axis. These are formal rules. They're also social hierarchies and the whole thing is generated very simply with these rules and it sets the pattern. And uh, there are certain problems because they had developed the outside and they had no way of getting in. So the entrances over the boundary condition, the gateways, uh, you know, compared to a mall, were very difficult. Like this one is Rose Passage, where you go actually through the pub. And, uh, you know, it, it, and even the, the axial main entrance to the scenographic dominant image space, which is like the main axis of the mall, uh, you have to come in at an angle before you arrive. So this thing didn't really work perfectly, but it set the rules. And, well, these are other pieces that begin to obey these rules. This is St. James's with the church on the cross axis, the market originally over here, the streets that paid for it all around the edge, the honorific houses on the main square, the social hierarchy is contained with it, the cheaper things again on the edge. So here's the Duke of Bedford's new house where he came from Covent Garden. British Museum would be over here, and Bloomsbury Square, the cross axis, a street, the church, the market area in where Pizza Express is, and, uh, you know, this is the back, all this back stuff really pays for it. His, his friends would all live around his front yard on the square and the, the entrance uh, Bloomsbury Way. This is Soho, the same thing, the, the guy who owned it lived on the main square, main axis coming in. Uh, and then in this case, the church down the bottom on the cross axis. This is Seven Dials, slightly aberrant, There's, you know, with the f all the streets coming to the central thing. This is, was a round point, came from a garden pattern, it's not really an urban pattern. But again, it's an important fractal because when they start making street systems, this haunts them. And this is just, uh, I feel like I'm importing coals to Newcastle, but you know, when I'm doing this in America, I can show Bedford Square and say, ah, it's up here, or so on. So, but this is putting those pieces together 
and putting the topography, which is the perturbation coming through the system, and the, air, the gray areas between the areas of order being highlighted. Now, this drawing was done in 1970-71. I hadn't got anything about fractals at that time, but I knew that there was something going on between here. This is actually Longacre, where they used to build, it was an industrial area, where they built coaches. It belonged to the city of London. Uh, and they owned it because they wanted to get the water from the stream when it was a field. So, they, you know, this thing has a, all sorts of reverberations through <coughs> history. And here, I, it was interesting, in 19, I was making connectors. The connector roads are in yellow. So I was interested in the relationship between these pieces when it hit the perturbations coming through. So you have the fractal system running into trouble in these areas. Like St. there was uh, St. Giles in the fields, there was the whole little village up here where the Roman road broke when it hit the stream and came around. Uh, that, had, that was a little slum village. There was another one down by St. Martin's in the fields. So they, you know, they left those alone, they, wor they, they worked around them. But this is early on, this is 1760, like 1660s to like 1700. But you can see that the scale, you remember I'm talking about the scale, here's the first one. They're getting bigger as they come out and as they move west. This is a lot bigger than that and there's a scale jump going on. And, oh, this is, sorry, these are just a little clearer looking in close how that works. And this is the way they drew it at the time with Piccadilly. And it's interesting, Piccadilly has these great landowners' houses that follow a completely different system, the French hotel with the courtyard in front and the back garden. But then when they get short of money, they develop some streets in the back. Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting, like Burlington, uh, in the back of Burlington House. And then when he gets short of money, he develops Burlington Arcade coming through here. So it's uh, um, an interesting system. And, okay, so what I want to do now is quickly go through... Oh, here's the uh, larger systems coming to the west. They're in these sort of uh, Tyburnia, Portman Estates, uh, the uh, um, Grosvenor Estates. They were rich, they're still richer than the Queen, uh, the Duke of Westminster. Here, this we were looking at uh, Covent Garden and this area before. Now you can see when they get out on the gravel terrace, the thing really gets humming. And then they start building roads around, like this is 1760s, they build a bypass around. And then in the 1860s, they build the embankment on the other side. And these are the old Roman roads coming through. And here you can see the streams coming down and through, creating these perturbations right the way through. But what happens is that whereas the streams stopped them connecting earlier, here they actually continue streets right the way through from the Cavendish Harley Estate into the Portman Estate and then even into the, the Church of England and the Tyburn Estate. So these things hook through uh, and um, uh, they begin to coordinate them into larger grids. And so the system's getting larger and more coordinated. And if you start to look at it, like in Tyburnia around, you have two major streets that meet at a triangle and then these squares off it. And it's becoming quite an elaborate system around Paddington. And if you go down into Belgravia, there's, you know, b all these different uh, squares, uh, uh, Belgrave Square, the, the, I can't remember their names right now, but the two long, thin squares. There's a whole system of squares. This is getting an enormous acreage that's being covered. And the thing's becoming more and more distended and harder and harder to run. And at the same time, the railway's coming in and the growth of the city's going, you know, right off the map. And also these enormous institutional objects are being set up, like uh, London University, Albert Hall, the railway set up, you know, the, the phase change going from street to big object. Uh, the railways sort of say it all. But the, because the uh, landowners sit in the House of Lords down in, in, uh, in the Houses of Parliament here, they can't run trains through London. So all the trains stop on the edge. And, uh, you know, there's only the one little railway that goes through uh, Fleet Valley. Okay, so um, this is looking at that sort of phase change into the industrial era. This is looking at trying to run a road across central London. This is the Aldrich Kingsway, the way it is now. Uh, these are the roads that were cut, disappeared because of it. You see there was a cul-de-sac into a stables. 
and then Drury Lane went up over here and there was, Drury Lane was the main road to the north of London and so it was a, you know, from Fleet Street and it was a real mess and then they sort of cut this in. These drawings, are, if you know, for 1971 this isn't bad, I'm flipping figure ground and ground figure in the same drawing and um, well, Danny Liebskin liked them, I should say. <laughs> in 76. <laughs> and these are other ones. Uh, uh, picking out, um, I'm going to show you movies of this in a minute. I've got to start stopping now. Uh, picking out the um, fractal uh, estates. And now what I'm setting up is a different system. If these are encl enclaves, these are street systems or armatures that are balanced against them. And in order to get you know, to the, the fruit and vegetable market, which is dominating here, up to the railway stations, they start cutting all these streets. And as they do it, it's also in the entertainment district they put theatres in. And this is Shaftesbury Avenue, Charing Cross Road, uh, Trafalgar Square. Of course, there's um, Regent Street uh, going up to Regent's Park on the other side here. And, so, and then I've got mapped, a mapped against, and this is the Aldwych Kingsway, which was connecting the streetcar system, the tramway system from South London to the streetcar system in North London. It's the only way through. And it was done by the LCC. And they were originally going to build their headquarters there, but they decided it was too valuable and they went to the South Bank. In the current debate, I would think they should think about that site. But anyway, here you can see how the street is cutting through the old estate. And you know, here it's done with the landowner's permission. But in this case, it was done without the landowner's permission. They had the power of eminent domain after 1890, and, uh, when the LCC gets going, this whole balance of power alters in central London. And in this case, I've started to put in the village pieces, like uh, down by St. Martin's in the Fields, St. Giles, uh, Drury Lane, and uh, where they used to build the coaches along Long Acre. And uh, the, you can see that this, there's this sort of tree-like structure uh, of these cul-de-sacs that are all off this old village system that's balanced against the, the armatures of the big highways that are set against the um, um, estates. So I've got three different systems of fractals here running against each other and that's um, kind of, uh, and you can write simple rules for the estates, I tried to sort of describe it you can write simple rules for these. You can say they can't go through the main square and things like that. Uh, and you can write simple rules for these, these tree-like structures. So that, you know, the fractal system was implicit in this thing, even though I um, didn't know about it. Uh, and, and this, I'm just going to fly through this. This is the railway, the shift, the phase change to these enormous, as this, the armature speed accelerates, uh, so these object buildings become larger and larger. And uh, there's th this is all part of the sort of phase change away from the row house towards the semi-detached villa. It's all very corny, you all know it. And here's how the railways actually got connected with the world's first underground railway, the Circle Line, 1866. Uh, and then what happened within the city of London itself were that there were these huge mercantile exchanges built. This is the coal exchange very beautiful cast iron building that's been demolished. Uh, that, so that the institutions within the city itself, like the railway stations, they turn internally and become these enormous atriums. These are tree structures as opposed to open lattice structures and they start to occupy whole blocks. And it happens whether it's the commercial or the state and this is part of the sort of phase change away from a, a sort of more open city. And this is just looking, um, this is a really important map for me. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's sort of blending a bit on the center here. But you can see here's Paddington coming in and there's no development out to the west of it. Ah, beautiful. Yes. Well, uh, uh, well uh, use your imagination, right? <laughs> and here's the East End with London Dock and the East and West India Docks. I mean, these docks were so enormous and they really represented a huge investment and they really represented you know, the, you know, the realization that Britain was going to beat France and be the number one in the world for the 19th century and London was going to be the capital of the 19th century. Uh, but it was based on rail, it wasn't a very pretty city. 
And, but it, here you can see that the west end has grown out to the park and then it more or less finishes. And then you can see out here that the new typology of the villas are out in the edge. Wherever you go, it's all villas. And so there's a, th as the railways come through and the docks come out on the other side, uh, there's this shift in the typology except for the very poorest people who are crammed in on the old degraded street system in you know, the, the East End. And this is just looking at the docks. Uh, I've got a little movie that I want to show now. Uh, you know, what an amazing system. And instead of the green in the center of the square, there's this enormous open space in which enormous ships can move. And, uh, mo and, and also there's shipbuilding yards and the whole system. There's every possible commodity that's controlled by the city of London. There's a dock for it. And every possible part of the globe, Baltic, East India, West India, uh, you, know, in, uh, w you name it. Uh, it's all there. And it was all wiped out in the Blitz. I mean, it would have gone anyway, probably. But it's a beautiful engineering drawing from the uh, 1870s uh, uh, initially and then going through into the 1920s. And uh, it's interesting that the void here is the active space. Uh, the railways work on the periphery and then uh, everything's contained within a wall. So you have the perfect enclave with the dock wall all around it, the very carefully controlled gates, so, and then each warehouse is a bonded warehouse and yet another set of enclosing walls. So you have a, a, a box, it's like a Russian doll with a box within a box within a box within a box, and they're moving boxes on moving ships, which are boxes. So you have this amazing system of, uh, uh, you know, it's a kind of fractal system also, but it's a very different dynamic than what's happening in the West, in which you have peace and calm, theoretically, in the center of Bedford Square. Uh, well, this is, I, I haven't really got anything more to, I mean, I want the movies, I'm desperate. Uh, <laughs> this is just looking at uh, new towns and the ring roads and so on and so forth, you know all the modern stuff. And then looking at the recentering, they're still using the hierarchical structure. With, this is from the 80s, uh, Greater London Plan, just before they went under. Uh, and then the impossibility of building the ring road was a, just like the railways never got through the center, the roads never got through the center of London. So it's, there's this funny blockage that slows everything down, that makes the city somehow impossible, but much more attractive in certain ways. It's complicated. And then the whole repolarization of London, if you like, with the docklands, which had been this incredibly emptied out negative space, being turned around. And what did they use to turn it around? You know, one of these sort of postmodern enclaves, which is, you know, one of my, it's a fractal, if you like. It has a very clear perimeter. It's all de defined by water, pretty much. Uh, and then it has, you know, a kind of main armature, a vertical armature to the tower and a sequence of spaces that lead through it. It's completely detached from everything else around it, uh, only reachable by you know, sort of certain privileged means of transportation, uh, which proved its undoing. And, but yet, at the same time, they're trying to make a strange attractor in the East End and repolarize London with the, dock, with the airport further out, out towards the East, instead of Heathrow and the West. And it's an, you know, for me, this was like, Yes, very interesting. I'm so, I mean, I don't like the design, please. You know, I'm not saying this is good urban design, but, uh, and Mrs. Thatcher was never my favorite. But the idea, and, and poor East Ends, they got dumped yet again. But, you know, th but the idea that the East could be a place of attraction. We always used to go and buy old carpets and things in Brick Lane and all this stuff, you know, with the, in amongst the ruins. But the idea that it could come out of the ashes like this was unimaginable in the 60s. And I'm not sure it was so, you know, maybe we were right not to imagine, I don't know. <laughs> so um, I've finished these slides, I think. And I want my last little movies, which should take about five minutes. Awesome moves to the rescue. Not, uh, now this is prepared especially for you tonight, that you're seeing it for the first time. I would say I'm seeing it for the first time too on a big screen. <laughs> and we want, what is it? F uh, f London 777. This is our plane. Uh, yeah, go, go. 
And this is, um, no, actually I actually have a little story to tell you here. Uh, I'm sorry, they sh okay, while they're figuring this out, hold it, hold it for a second. There should be a soundtrack to this. I, I, I teach a class at Columbia when we have a room like this. And the, the students produce these amazing animations of cities. And I show them Antwerp and they, they kind of go off and do their city. But then, as opposed to me where it's this deep silence, they have, you know, music. Okay, this should have some acid, London acid city kind of music, you know. Trance, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So now, there's a nice story about this. When I was young, I've always tried to be open and generous and not guard my work. And uh, it pays. Uh, Sir John Summerson was incredibly generous to me. He never taught me. Uh, I studied in Cornell. He was not particularly fond of uh, Colin Rowe. But I went to see him, and he got down on the floor with me with my drawings, which I brought. And we, his secretary came in and she just looked like, here's this old guy and me crawling around the floor looking at the, the maps. Those are the ones I showed you before. And he, uh, he's correcting me. And, and, you know, I acknowledge a huge debt to him. And then um, when my turn came, Ed Jones was doing a guidebook to London. And he, he knew my work from teaching at Cornell. And he asked me, Graham, can I take your great estates? And he was teaching at the RCA, and he drew them all to scale in 72 pieces, which I had never succeeded in doing. So just let that be a lesson to you. It pays back. When I got stuck wanting to do this, and I, I started to do this, and I was trying to cut up the Ordnance Survey in Photoshop, and I realized there was like actually 130-something of them. I thought, oh my god, I'm never going to get it done. And then Osama was asking me something, and I pulled out Ed's book, and by coincidence, there it was. These are Ed Jones's drawings, right? <laughs> or his students' drawings. And I said, okay, Ed, we can scan these in no time. And <laughs> so these are, he, you know, like, okay, we've got to slow this down. Uh, awesome, awesome, awesome. Let's get to the beginning and slow it down. This goes west and then it goes east if you watch. Okay, is this the beginning? Okay. Um, okay, so here you have the city. That was Covent Garden, Leicester Square, Lincoln's Inn Field. I don't know what this is out here. No, wait. <laughs> it's happening. Uh, I, this needs a little work, shall we say. There's Grosvenor Square. Uh, in Houses of Parliament dropped in a strange place. Anyway, it's, you see that it's like a pockmarked face. It's sort of growing, uh, when I finished with this, these will grow out westward in the way that they should. And there'll be, and this is a work in progress at the moment, there's Notting Hill Gate. And this whole area, I'll map it against the whole area. I'm very, very excited about this. Now, okay, so this, the west end is going to be on automatic pilot. Now, what should start happening is the east end should come in. Is it in a minute? Here it goes. And I'm going to get these guys coordinated in the right time sequence I, uh, so that the west and the east will be growing together. And I'll have this little uh, wonderful animation. And then I'll get the music <laughs> <laughs> and put it on the web and you'll be able to see it, you know, download it. It'll be great. Okay, I've, um, I've almost finished. I've got one other movie to show you. Uh, Fractal, yep. Yeah. So this is based on my thesis, um, uh, and this one is a little more refined because we had more time to work on it. So there's Covent Garden, uh, Leicester Square, the r connections to the west which weren't there before, St. James's Square, this isn't the proper sequence, uh, connection in Lincoln's in Fields, Bloomsbury Square. Soho Square, Seven Dials. Oh, down here, Charing Cross. That, um, that, this is uh, Oxford Street and Trafalgar Square, Nash, 1800, 1807. Cutting through and thinking regionally. And then uh, New Oxford Street, the, all of a sudden the center's changing and they need access. And so where the streams were, 
and where the river was, they're laying in the new transportation technology. And now they need to get the streetcars from the north to the south and Aldrich Kingsway. So there you go. Okay. Um, I'm finished right on time. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah.